You're listening to the Play It Brave podcast. Join Darcy for a wild rummage around in her wit and wisdom. She's a photographer, an educator, and a marketing ninja. Each week, she's going to be teaching you all about creating a life full of mindset, money, and marketing miracles. Listen to real-world experiences and surefire strategies from expert guests, all to keep you focused on your path to success. Think less hand-holding or fist bumps. So stop playing safe. It's time to start playing it brave. Here's your host, Darcy Benincosa. Welcome to today's episode of the Play It Brave podcast. We have a very special guest, Elizabeth Austin Davis, a beautiful film photographer, also an amazing mom, wife, woman, uh, an avid traveler. And Elizabeth, you are someone who is so dedicated to documenting love, Mm -hmm. helping people have amazing experiences bringing inclusivity into the wedding industry. You have so many passions and I am so grateful that you are on the podcast today. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So I want to know a little bit more about you and then we are going to dive into the inclusivity pledge that you Mm -hmm. helped to create, which is so important for the wedding industry. And I felt like as I read it, it was really amazing specifics. And then we also Mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit more about I think just your experience in general and your story. So Mm -hmm. how, how do we get started with this? Tell us a little (laughs) bit of how you started as a creative and ultimately became a wedding photographer. Yeah. So, um, I originally grew up in Cleveland. I'm from Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Um, and I started my, like my career in being, um, a wedding or photographer in high school. Like I would just take photos for my friends. I did their, um, their graduation photos, like not thinking anything of it. I just was really like interested in it. My dad was always a photographer. My dad and my uncle was always a photographer, but like hobbyist, nothing, you know, serious. Mm -hmm. So then when I went to undergrad, I went to undergrad at Tuskegee university, which is a HBCU in Alabama. And there I was pursuing my business degree. And again, photography came back up again. Um, like I would take pictures for like the Mr. And Mrs. campaign of the, of, for like the campaigns for people for, um, the school year Mm. and, um, and then like graduation photos again at that point. And I went into corporate America. I worked for one of the, um, defense, uh, companies that are, uh, that are out there. So I moved to San, um, to St. Louis and then there, you know, I, was in corporate America for a long time and I met my husband, got married, I have two kids. And yeah, so that's kind of like the beginning of my career started, uh, photography, uh, doing weddings in 2015. Um, and I'm very blessed to say that I've, I traveled to different cities to do weddings. My husband's job has moved us three, three or four times at this point. So I work out of different markets and it's been a really good journey. Well, your portfolio is stunning. And the way that you see love and capture couples is completely, I don't know, romantic. And it's it drew me in from the second that I saw your website. The other thing that I love is you have all different shapes and sizes on your website. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> That's yes. amazing. You have all different, you know, colors on your website. Mm-hmm. And I feel like you have so much, especially over the last few weeks as we've talked, you have Mm -hmm. so much good advice for how to bring more of this into the industry because the spotlight has been shined. I don't know that if, is it shown shined, but (laughs) the spotlight has been put on in the last few weeks. And can I just read your pledge? I don't know. I kind of want to read pledge or do you want to read it? And we talk about some of it. So Elizabeth, along with some other women in the industry came up for an inclusivity pledge for vendors and venues. And I want to go through some of the points about it and then let you talk about what inspired that. Um, I think it's going to be kind of obvious on some of them because they haven't been happening, but I would love Mm -hmm. to hear behind, like behind the scenes, what was the dialogue that happened to come up with these? So one of them is a commitment to have at least 20% of existing vendor lists include black vendors. We discourage lists that only include black vendors. So let's Let's tackle this item first. Mm -hmm. That has to be something so simple 
and so obvious and it's probably so painful how much it's hasn't happened. <laughs> yeah. Right? And, you know, I think, you know, that one in particular, because the spotlight has been shown, you know, a lot of publications have started, you know, shining the light on vendors uh, that are that are black. And it's like, while that is great, our ultimate goal is to be included with everyone else. Our yeah. ultimate goal is to be able to allow our work to stand for itself. Like, yeah. I, if I'm on a list, I want to be there because my work is good, not just because I'm black. Yeah. So uh, some Someone sent me, I think it was my friend Kelbert sent me a screenshot and it basically was I love was Kelbert. Like, yeah, he's amazing. <laughs> he's and so wonderful. He, he is. And it was basically, uh, to sum it up, was saying that uh, Black people don't want to be invited because we're Black. Like, we don't want to be hired because we're, we're Black. Like, we actually want that to stop. Like, at the end of the day, you know, I we want to move to the point of where our work can shine for itself. So, Absolutely. you know, I, I think that, you know, um, it's important and I understand why those mechanisms are in place and I don't see them, you know, going anywhere as of yet because we're still developing and having this conversation. But the goal is to be able to allow our work to stand for itself. I know I keep repeating that, but that is like so important to everyone and how hard that we work. That's all, I, I know that's all everyone wants is to be able to say like, I want to be able to compete because if I'm the best, I want to say that I'm the best, like period. And I don't want to be the best because I'm black, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I affirm everything that you're saying. Okay. Let's get to number two. <laughs> A commitment to move towards having at least 20% of our employees be black. Mm -hmm. So is that at the venue or what is that Just, within each business? Yeah, in general, because we know that economic strength is the key to, yeah. to changing the story and changing the narrative, right? We know that African Americans um, in terms of economics are behind because of the way and the laws and the systems that have been placed for generations Absolutely. to come, um, our generations past. So with us understanding that, we know that, you know, there are good black candidates that are out there. Um, the 20%, again, like these numbers are to be strived for in, uh, over time, like this isn't something that, you know, we are expecting to happen, you know, overnight. But again, we really do want to put, um, you know, uh, numbers to it to be able to say, you know, this is the direction that we want to go. Yeah, I feel like this is the theme of this is like, I think what's happened in the last few weeks is especially for me, I have become aware of businesses I did not know exist because of all the sharing, which mm -hmm. to me has been an excellent resource because it's like, oh, I didn't know that. Sometimes we get caught in our own circles. We get comfortable with our own people. We don't mm -hmm. branch, branch out. We work with people we work with again and again and again. And I think it's really about that branching out, being aware, looking who else is in the playing field and and really pointing, finding that person that's going to be the best person for the job. And you yeah. guys are, you know, you're saying it so clearly. So I, I'm going to read through the rest of these. And then I want to talk to the, to the last one. So it says a commitment to refer black owned businesses to clients and ideally 20% of event vendors be black, a commitment to include black couples and models on websites and within marketing materials, which I think everybody as soon yeah. as it started happening was like, I have a picture of a black person. And they just put it <laughs> on their Instagram, which it was like, you know what? Everybody's trying their best to show like, I, I want to be inclusive, which I think that's why I love this pledge. I think taking a pledge is really important. I think that, um, not, you know, doing it for two weeks and then letting things go back to normal or whatever. I really don't think it's going to, but how, how are you feeling? Like it's been a couple of weeks. Do you feel like people are getting complacent again? Do you feel like, um, you know, businesses are really putting these pledges forward? How have you seen? Um, I'm skeptical and I have to be honest because okay. We have been having these conversations since my father was born. Like exactly. this has been a very, very long time. It feels different. I'm not going to say that it doesn't. It feels really different. And I want to put faith in people opening up their bubble to see how other people live because that's really what it's about. Mm -hmm. um, so I do hope so. I do think that now with, especially with these bigger companies that they have, um, 
like their feet are to the fire because they they have a lot to lose if they don't. But with inside of the wedding industry, it, we're going to have to work very, very hard at it because there's no regulation. There's no one telling you yeah. that you have to do this. There's nothing out there to make us more inclusive. It's a bunch of people deciding that we want to make this decision to be inclusive ourselves. So, yeah. you know, um, I think that pe- I'm going to go and give people grace in the hearts that they have, but um, I'm, I think I, that's how I'm going to move forward with it. I think that that's the best way to say it. Like I have a lot of faith that this is not, this is different because it feels different. Well, as someone who has a larger platform, I do think it feels different, but I also feel like I can't let up. I can't get complacent again. Like I have to take responsibility for my own anti-racist behavior and I'm I'm ready to hit any any of my other white friends over the head and be like, "Listen, yeah. you're forgetting, you're easing up. These conversations are still important." You know, I think that that and that's why I want to lead into this last part of the pledge you talked about, a commitment to have an inclusion statement displayed on your website. Yes. Um that is important. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about what that looks like to you. Um, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't have the exact words of what it would be, but I could tell you what it would mean for someone that looks like me. Um, because I know like being realistic in people's demographics, you know, I know that, you know, uh, cause I was speaking to another f- uh, photographer. She's in uh, Colorado. She's a- actually African-American. She was like, there's just not a lot of us here. So just me as a person, when I'm searching, it will allow me to feel like I'm welcome. And again, yeah. have, have an understanding of this is important to you. Like, I think again, like this whole time that we have we have come to the conclusion that not being racist is not enough. We need to be anti-racist and saying that in, in, in that form of that statement will allow people to feel more welcome because I think, you know, there's, there's a sense of, of on the, on both sides of, you know, is this really for me? You know, cause a lot of times, again, we, we have felt that it, it it's not for us, you know, mm-hmm. and is this a place where I will be safe and like, safe mentally, safe physically, like just safe period. So, you know, um, I think that that is important for people to see that. And, you know, and I hate to say it, but we're up against a lot. Not everybody believes that this is a, this is a fight that we should be having, right? Not everybody believes of the systematic racism or the systems in place in this country to keep people, to keep minorities in poverty. Like they don't believe that. So to be able to say that we're welcome, I feel is, is very important in moving forward so that we we all can move forward together. It's like an acknowledgement that they understand, at least in part, that white supremacy is real. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. Just admitting that. I think, you know, as we have seen things happening with, I, I personally watched all the video footage that came out of so many of the deaths. You know, a lot of my friends are like, I can't watch it. I'll never, I won't be okay. And I felt it was my duty to watch it. And Mm -hmm. as a human watching what's happening. And, you know, I think when we look at murder on camera, Mm -hmm. we can feel really incensed and we can get to that space of like, yes, we need to work at this. As I've gone through my life before this happened and with my friends, I remember going to NYU and we were, I was, you know, two of my best friends in the program were black women and we all went to travel. And every time we went through the airport, uh, they got pulled out. I did it to get checked. The first time it went through, you know, I was, they were like, they were like, see, this is what happens. And white little me was like, oh, maybe it was like inside. I had a seed of doubt, right? Like, mm-hmm. is it really about race? right? White people ask that a lot inside a little bit. Mm -hmm. The second time it happened, they're like, after I said that, they go, look, Darcy, it's going to happen again. Like, I don't know if you Mm want to open your eyes to this, but it's going to happen again. And it happened again. And I was like, okay. And then I said, I, you know, I had a seed of doubt and I'm so sorry because I'm seeing it again. And then it happened many more times because we had to go through like six airplanes to get to where we were going. Mm -hmm. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'm getting at with that story is that there are so many little things Mm -hmm. that happen that are tiny compared to watching a murder on, on a video that we don't understand is actually the deep systemic racism. Mm -hmm. And 
I wanted to talk to you about times where do you feel quite often that you aren't going to be believed or that people are not going to take you seriously? I know you had a recent experience, even just with the birth of your child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll I'll talk about that story because I think it's a a good example of what could have happened negatively. Um, You know, uh, just in uh, statistics, black women, when we give birth, we are more likely to die. And I don't want to say that like if it's five times or three times, because I can't remember, but um, we are, we're more likely to die in childbirth than um, our white counterparts. So I was going to, I was living in Knoxville at the time. I was going to OBGYN and I just was not comfortable there. I felt like it was always a question of, you know, the issues that I had, like how bad were they really? Mm -hmm. Um, And then when I found out that I was pregnant with my son, um, I decided, oh, there's something happened in between that. So before I got pregnant, I read Essence a lot. And there was an article in there talking about the more mortality rate for black women giving birth. And it was talking about, you know, um, things that we can do to be more proactive and um, seeking out a black doctor, basically what it was saying. And um, so when I found out that I was pregnant, um, I decided that it was time for me to switch doctors because it was my first time (laughs) giving birth to a child. I'm terrified as it is. Mm -hmm. And to add that on top of it, to say, is the person taking care of me going to take care of me and having that seed of doubt, I wanted to put my hands in where, where somebody might believe that if I'm in pain, I'm really in pain. Like my pain level is what it is, you know? Um, so I decided to go to Dr. Thickpin and I always say his name because he's an amazing man. Mm-hmm. And my pregnancy was amazing. I had a few hiccups here and there, uh, gave birth to my son. And a couple of weeks after giving birth to my son, my neck was enlarged. And it wasn't like so big that it was like a problem, but my mom pointed it out to me. She said, you need to ask your doctor about this. And I brushed it off like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm hormonal. I just gave birth. <laughs> like this, this whole process is like my body is changing. So I went to Dr. Thickpin and he was like, you know what, let's just do an ultrasound just in case. Like, let's just double check it to make sure that there's nothing extra. Like it may just be hormones with your body changing, but you know, let's just do that. So we went down the path of doing um, an ultrasound and then we did another ultrasound and then a biopsy. And then I went to a specialist and it, it ended up, I had thyroid cancer and I had to have my wow. total thyroid removed. Wow. Um, and it started with my OBGYN scheduling that um, ultrasound. Now my thyroid cancer was not like physically as bad as other cancers. And I always like to say that because, you know, I know that when people see the word cancer, they think, you know, the, the worst, but it was definitely mentally trying. Like I was breastfeeding at the time. I had to stop breastfeeding. Um, and it was a mental struggle to say, like, I don't know what's going to happen. Like through that yeah. process, we didn't know. So, uh, we went through, we ended up having it taken out. I had to have radioactive iodine twice. And, you know, at that moment is really when I became, you know, a wedding photographer, because I said to myself, if I'm going to live my life, I'm going to live, if, if God, you're going to allow me to live, I'm going to do what, what I absolutely love. But then, you know, on the flip side of saying that, like, what if, and that, what if I would have stayed where I was at? What if, you know, I, if we would have never found my thyroid cancer, like where would I be right, right now? Would have metastasized somewhere else? Like, those are the type of things that, you know, as black women or, or men in this country, like we have to think about and we have to make due diligence. And I think that it is sad that I felt like I had to go to a black doctor in order for me to, to feel safe. And I was going to a man doctor. I really wrestled with that because I wasn't like, I talked to my husband, like I wasn't comfortable, you know, um, with an, a male o- OBGYN, but I felt like he would understand me more than, than anyone else in this particular, you know, I felt safe. So, you know, I, I made a lot of concessions, but at the end of the day, it was the best decision I've ever made in my life. And, but I also don't feel like I should have had to make that choice, but that's the reality that we live in. These are the things that we have to think about. Like, um, when it comes to, to living and wanting to live in this country. Yeah. You bring it, you, you, you know, what I watched this, I watched you tell a little bit of this story on your Instagram stories. And when you kind of mentioned that black women die more often in childbirth than white women, 
it immediately like, aha, of course, you know, if we're having all of this racism, if we're having all of this unrest, of course, that's going to take a toll in that, that one, like, I can't imagine a more vulnerable situation than giving birth ever. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that on your stories, I went and did some research and I was just, my mind was blown. And, 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 Not really though. You know, I want to say my mind was blown, but I have to Mm -hmm. say I wasn't that surprised because I am very aware of, of the racial divide in our country. And I think, you know, living outside of America and living inside of America, I am even more aware of it in those perspectives. So when you said that, I thought, oh my gosh, it all comes down to the safety. And you've said this again, you know, we can do the little things of saying, putting in inclusivity statement on our website. And that is a sign of, Hey, I'm safe. We can, you trusted your intuition, your amazing, deep, powerful, feminine intuition. And you just knew at this doctor, I am not feeling very safe. Mm -hmm. And you followed your intuition to that safety. Mm -hmm. I, I want to, I want to talk more about how we can bring in that feeling of safety into the wedding industry because like you, I'm hopeful, and, and this does feel a little different, um, but I'm also feeling like you, like, is it just going to go, is it just going to be swept under the rug in another month or two and not keep the momentum? So you and I were talking a little bit about things that need to change in the industry. One mm-hmm. is all of the kind of events, the big events, the the workshops, and really making sure that there is inclusivity there. And you had kind of said a, you know, with these photography conference, you had a quote. Do you have that quote? Do you want me to say it? You kind of wrote yeah, it you could say it. if you have it. Yeah, you could go ahead and say it. <laughs> okay. So you said, because I said, hey, about photography conferences, what might feel unsafe there that white people do not recognize, right? Because I think, I think that a lot of people want to help bring that safety in. They just don't know how, or they, they've never felt that I am sure that I've never felt the levels of feeling unsafe that you have. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we haven't experienced it ourselves, sometimes it's easier to turn a blind eye that it exists. Mm -hmm. So you had said this quote, I think you said the best way, the best way to describe this is talking about inclusivity. And there's a good quote that says, diversity is being invited to the dance and inclusivity is being asked to dance. Yeah. Um, I that love is not my that. quote. I just <laughs> want to say that. that I, I can't, I think she's the VP of Netflix. That was her, her quote, but okay. that really sums it up like in uh, terms of like what it needs to be, because I can be in a room or I can be in a conference and biases are real. Like mm-hmm. just the, the, the step of not even taking the time to get to know me or to talk to me, or if I come and try to talk to you, just kind of blown off. You know, Mm -hmm. I think, especially when it comes to wedding conferences, I feel that I have been kind of blown off until you see my work or you see my Instagram following. Like those are the two things that I feel like get people to want to talk to me. So I think it's just naturally, like it's already a stressful situation. You're already Mm -hmm. trying, you don't know anyone. It's natural to try to find someone that you can connect with that may look like you. But also now I feel like those type of things, now that we're aware of how it even feels to a person of color walking into a room that has no one else that looks like them, making that extra step to try to make friends. Because I feel that our biggest issue in this country is we are living in our bubbles and we are not communicating anymore or talking to each other anymore or trying to see somebody else's perspective. You know, um, like I said, my family has moved a lot. We have lived in big cities. We've lived in small cities. And the one thing that I would say that I have learned is just not wanting to connect with people that way out of whatever fear, bias, or what it, whatever it is. So being able to take that initiative within yourself to say, I'm nervous, but I'm just going to try to talk with someone that doesn't look like me today. Let me see mm-hmm. what I can, what connection I can make and make it a, a, a thought in the front of your mind. Because I've met some amazing friends from these conferences, from conversations of people coming to introduce themselves to me. And like, now we're, 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 we have counterparts that I can work with of needing a second shooter or things like that. Like in terms of business, um, I think it's a, a good thing to do. And I think um, it's the right thing to do. Absolutely. And 
I, I want to invite people to dance, you know, (laughs) well asked to dance. So like not just coming to the dance and being a wallflower, right. Which I have Mm -hmm. seen many conferences, there will be a couple women of color, people of color, but it it is, it does feel inter, you know, Mm -hmm. I always say I, I used to date a guy lives in LA when he would come to visit Salt Lake, which has not as much diversity with black people. And he would land at the airport and I would always joke like he's six foot five and black and beautiful, right? And I'm like, <laughs> I can't find you. Where are you? And he's like, yeah, only chocolate chip in this cookie, Darcy. You know that I'm really here. And I just think, you know, how was it from his experience? I always wondered from his experience and I'd ask him a lot, like, how does it feel sometimes being the only black person in this restaurant? You're the only black person as we go on a walk to the park. You're the only black person. Like, and I think that happens a lot at these photography conferences. It can be a very white centric place with a couple people on the, on the border. And so what are ways you're saying, just have a conversation. I think they need to be keynotes. You know, we need Mm -hmm. to have more keynote speakers. Uh, Obviously we need more, I think we need more women voices in the industry overall. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the male photographers always get more glorified somehow Mm -hmm. than the women photographers, but are there any other things that you would love to see at photography conferences? Maybe just your inclusivity pledge that 20% of everything being done at every photography conference is people of color. And then I also would encourage like going to a photography conference that is hosted by black people as well, like going there to meet, to meet, you know, um, different people. So a really good one is called the cookout. Um, one of my friends, um, Tamaya Coven, she puts that on every year and coming on the podcast soon. Oh, perfect. Yeah. (laughs) She's amazing. And, you know, uh, I think, I think we can't stop with the way that we feel or feeling uncomfortable because yeah. it's like, it's already hard enough to meet friends. Like I just feel like with women, it's kind of harder for us to connect just in general. So like putting yourself in those um, situations where you feel uncomfortable and the uh, magic and the gems that will come out of them um, and giving yourself a different perspective as well. Like you are just because the, the, the conference is put on by black people does not mean that you're not welcome. The reason mm-hmm. why the photographer, the conference was made because we have been in situations where we weren't catered to, but at the end of the day, like this could still be for you as well. Like we're, 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 the classes are gen, are general in terms of what we're talking about. So that conference is absolutely amazing. And I would highly recommend anyone um, going to it and you get to step into, you know, a room where maybe you'll get an idea of what it feels like to be uh, like, to be the only one in the room, like a, a very small, <laughs> a small percentage of like what that feels like and um, the uncomfortableness that we do feel. Uh, I think that we are conditioned at this point. I'm conditioned. Like it doesn't, like I don't get as nervous as I used to. And you know, it, it, it's just a part of life because we are the minority Um, just in like, in terms of numbers, like in the country as well, you know? So um, I think that would probably be the best thing to do um, to move forward and um, to make sure that when you're in that situation of, of going to those type of conferences, of meeting people and talking, like, it's hard to get out your shell, uh, at least for me. And that's why I keep saying that, like, I have a hard time talking to people as it is. And that extra step of, you know, I, it, it just makes it difficult sometimes. Yeah. Well, I love it. Well, we'll definitely put a link to the cookout. We're going to put a link to the pledge. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that as we wrap up this interview, is there anything else we want to discuss around how to keep the momentum going, you know, how to yeah. not get complacent and, and realize, you know, I understand that is my mm-hmm. job completely, mm-hmm. but if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I think right now, the one thing that I say about this experience is it's very personal. And this is this is a lifelong mission. This is not something that's going to be fixed overnight. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the things I always go back to is uh, our e- economic strength and pouring that economics back into the Black community because... Uh, because of biases and the way that people feel like this isn't, I'm not trying to be self-serving, but even like our restaurants, our, Mm -hmm. our books, everything. It's just like, there's so many amazing, you know, black businesses that are out there that uh, white people don't even look at or don't even know that's there. So I feel like that to me is real solidarity is when you try to 
put strength back into our community because a lot of the issues that people say, well, why can't you do this or why can't you do that? We are hundreds of years behind. Um, hundreds, it, yeah. hundreds of years behind in terms of our economic power. Like, I want people to go back and learn as much as they can. Understand what uh, what redlining is and what it did to our community. Understanding how those things are still in exist today. Understand how you know our these big corporations have just settled lawsuits for discriminating against you know black and brown people in the percentage that they are giving our home loans. Like those type of things, I feel like that we need to open our eyes to, to say, if we want America to be fair and if we want to move forward, then we need to be advocates for those things as well. Like if, if the whole notion of us taking care of ourselves inside of our community, I want to be able to get there as well, but I can't do that without the support of, of white people as well. Yeah. You know, and the one thing my, I remember talking to my dad about this, he was like, the civil rights act wasn't just black people. It was, it was a lot of people coming together to do what's right. And we need to continue to do that when it comes to just overall reform as well. Like um, this doesn't permeate just one area of my life. It goes from when I'm trying to get a car, from when I'm trying to get a house, from the neighborhood that I'm living in. Like it literally is present in every area of my life and the systems that we have in place. And it's going to take a lot of courage and a lot of sacrifices to change those things. And it's doing our part as individuals. Like these are all big things, Liz. So what can I do? What can you do? The Black person that works in your office, because I know some of us are part time. Um, if you see that they are being treated differently, go to HR for them. Because a lot of times I feel like things like that for us, like, again, this whole movement, we have been here saying the same things year over year over year. So being an ally to me is having those tough conversations. When people have those negative jokes that you think that are inappropriate, calling them out on it. Um, I'm not a very outwardly person. Like if you look at my Instagram, you don't see my children. Like I'm very private. So having those conversations, period, is where we're going to start and where this is going to continue to um, move forward. And I think um, for me, it's like I'm Black every day. Every day this world tells me that I'm Black. So mm -hmm. it is something that is uh, uh, in the forefront of my mind. So now that we are aware of this and now that we you see what this is, you it needs to be on the forefront of your mind to say, even if it's just asking questions to say, is this because... Like, why are you doing this? Like getting clarity, because I feel like those biases are what we see of like what you just said of like, is it really like that happens a lot? Like, no, mm -hmm. let's question it. And if it's not, then that's fine. But we have to get to the point of questioning it and saying, okay, that wasn't because of that. Okay, now let's move forward. It's not getting defensive. It's realizing that this is what happens on a daily basis for people in this country that don't look like you. I absolutely. That was so beautiful. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for all the wisdom you just dropped. We have to get out of our own bubbles because yes. if you're in the white bubble, the world can look really rosy. And, and, it, and people are like, oh, I don't want to watch the news. It's negative. I get that. I don't like watching the news either, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean I can be ignorant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I went and started teaching inner city high school when I was 24. So 20 years ago, almost. Yeah. And <laughs> I had two white students, the rest were, were black students, and I saw firsthand, and this is where my eyes got opened first, like the first opening, they keep getting open more and more of just how, how many systems were set up and still exist today to keep black people less than in servitude in all of these roles and white people just don't want to see it <laughs> or they think mm -hmm. it's not my problem because I didn't in institute these or they live in communities. Like I look at my community and I have to admit, I live in a very wealthy community of white people mm -hmm. and I have looked at this community. I've also lived in Harlem for years, right? So I've lived in the mm -hmm. two extremes and it's like, I look at, and not to call my neighbors out or anything, but they don't really, they're raising their kids and it doesn't affect them. It doesn't touch them. Mm -hmm. And so then you can ignore it. And I just think you have to take that step where it does touch you. You have to take that step where you educate yourself. You have to take that step where you read about the history of America. How many people just learned what Juneteenth was, right? Mm -hmm. You have to take that step. And I will be a voice for that forever because it's the only way Yes, it's it the is. The only way. 
and it has to be deeply uncomfortable. And you know what? I want to just be like, fuck comfortability. Excuse my language, but like too many people just want to stay comfortable. You and I did not build the businesses that we built by staying comfortable. We did not create the lives that we had by staying comfortable. I am the biggest advocate for getting uncomfortable, but most people want that to be really fun. I'm going to get uncomfortable. So I'm going to leave my day job and be, you know, this is not fun. You know, it's not fun to see this. It's not fun to, to see that you're part of the problem, right? It's not, it's not fun to learn. It's not fun to be educated. It's, you know, it's not fun to be holding up a mirror and saying, are you having these kinds of, it's not fun to tell your brother that was kind of racist, you know, or whatever. It's not fun to tell your dad, actually, that's not acceptable to say. We have to have these kind of conversations with people. We do. And, and I think, you know, like you said, I'm so glad you brought up your, your dad or your uncle or or your brother, because I feel like sometimes we think that these things are so far behind, like it was so long ago um, because I've had a lot of conversations this past week. And it's just the sense of, I did not think that this was happening in here or like a classism type thing of saying, you know, I thought this was something that only happened for those type of people that aren't us, like almost the othering type thing. But it's like, like, I think identifying that this is something that happens, that we are conditioned in this country, like this, the system is working in the way that it's supposed to, if you want to be completely 100% transparent, and we cannot rely or wait until our government or our, our officials to figure this out, like we have to make it a personal mission within your heart and within your soul to say that you want to do something different. Because they, like you said, for people to not even know what Juneteenth was, it's like the system is working the way that it was supposed to, like, why isn't this a holiday? Like, I've known yeah. about Juneteenth my entire life. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, so it's like those type of things. And again, like I I applaud you for wanting to take those conversations because that's what we need. And I, I know it's difficult. Um, and I, and I know it's uncomfortable, but my life is difficult and uncomfortable as well. And I really, I really want my work or my, my children, my son, when he stops being cute to people, Mm -hmm. when he starts becoming a young man, that he's not a threat where you feel like you have to call the cops on him. Like those are the type of things, like as a mom, I have to think about like, oh my goodness, can I let them go here? Can I, like, I don't, like, it's just a heightened sense of of, of being aware of it. So I hope that, you know, moving forward, um, I'm trying to touch as many people as possible and extend an olive branch and extend grace to you to say, okay, you didn't know. So now you know. So what are we going to do differently? What is going to happen next? And I think, like you said, that inclusivity pledge was our our way of helping that guidance to say this is the minimum this is the very start in our community <laughs> thank you for saying that yeah yeah the like minimum this is, <laughs> yeah this is like the the minimum of where we where we want this to go but you know um yeah i guess that's just kind of where where i am with it i i, I really hope things change um, I'm very thankful for the the women that I have been able to meet because they voted me to be in that video, and I was like astonished. <laughs> <laughs> it is such a beautiful video. We're gonna link. We're gonna link to that too. I I wanted to bring it back to your son for a minute. You know that reminds me of the same man I was talking about. He smiles a lot, right? Uh, he's not a super smiley person, but he smiles a lot when we're in public, especially in Utah. And I'm like, you're being so smiley, and he goes, that's what my mom taught me to do. Because when you're a six foot five black man, you have to smile so you don't seem Mm -hmm. threatening. And that was a huge aha to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with my brother, he has served time in jail. He's covered in tattoos. He used to tell racist jokes. He told one on vacation just recently. And he was like, can I say that? And my sister and I were like, no. And (laughs) and he goes, you know, I'm, I am learning. And I, I admire him for learning and for changing. And, you know, he, he has, he has a very hard job. He builds trailers. He's dealing with all of this stuff. He's dealing with a lot of things every day. And, and I was on a walk with a friend recently and he brought up that, um, George Floyd had a record, you know, well, George Floyd had a record as if that was some kind of excuse for George Floyd having his neck nailed upon for over mm-hmm. eight minutes. And I said, you know, my brother has a record. My brother's been in prison. My brother's a white dude. Do I want to see him 
no matter what his past has done. It's like these tiny little things that come up in conversation that people think that they can justify and they, and they're, they would not consider themselves racist, but they want to justify the reasons. And I think that's what we're coming back to is like, you, you know, don't need to justify why you have to go choose a new doctor or my friends are being pulled out every single time we go through police security, they're pulled out. I'm not what I wanted to justify that at the second that it happened and, and think, no, our, we don't want to live in a world this way. There's just a lot of that, that we have to face. Like you said, mm-hmm. like we have to understand you have to raise your sons differently than I would have to raise my sons. And mm-hmm. I don't want that. I don't yeah. want to live in a space where that ever, ever has to happen. And we might think in the bigger cities, maybe it's not happening as much, but I'll tell you what, a lot of America is not big cities. And after living in the South where I lived, where in 2000, I was living in Alabama in 2000, segregation was still existing. It is. It still I, exists I went, today. It does. Um, I went with a lot of those a, places. I was <clears throat> at a cafe and I told my friend, let's go in. She's black. She goes, I can't go in there. I'm like, what are you talking about? I cannot go in there. Mm-hmm. That is not a place that they will allow me in, in the year 2000. Mm-hmm. And that was a huge wake up call for me. And I think more segregation and, and more racism goes on than we even care to admit. And that's where we really have to just stop deluding ourselves <laughs> that it is yes. happening. And um, I want to go back to the one thing that you said about, you know, George Floyd's record. Um, you know, a lot of times I think, you know, we try to like that conversation comes up a lot like oh he had a record oh he was a felon yeah and i feel that we need to examine that what how like the way that our criminal justice system is set up is for men and women um of brown brown black and brown to be criminals like in terms of like the the sent the sentencing is different um i would encourage everyone to go look at that to see how differently uh the similar cases are set and um, the way that we are policed and the way that our, or even our children in juvenile are treated. Um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but it's a, there was this case out of New York where this young man was uh, accused of stealing a backpack. And he sat in Rikers Island for three years. I remember for, reading that. And I, I can't remember his name and we'll link to it. Um, yes. But he was not charged. He was not seen. Um, he had. He was denied bail because of a, another case that happened uh, prior. So he just sat there, and the system forgot about him. He was never charged with anything. He was just waiting for his case to be seen in front of a judge. Three years went by, and this young man came out, and he was forever changed by that experience. Um, I had an incident with my own brother, who is a doctor who works for UCLA, where when he was on at he was on vacation um, from undergrad and he got he was out with his friends. Something happened and he got he was put in jail and it was like the most horrible experience for my family. Um, And I actually wrote about this on um, Photo Visions uh, page because I Mm. feel like it's a really good example of how our young men are caught up in the system Mm -hmm. and how once you're stuck in the system and the way that you're sentenced, there's no reconciliation on making you a better person or righting your wrong like when you're a child from the time that you're an adult. So the things that you do as a child that are wrong, like 100%, like everyone needs to take responsibility for their actions, but we know that black and brown children are treated differently inside of our justice system than everyone else. So I, I, again, like that bringing up his past is, is a cap is a cop out in my opinion. It's a cop out in my opinion too. Because it is, we, again, the system is working the way that it's supposed to. The system has allowed you to say that black men are, are, are murderers or are, um, felons the, at a, at a larger rate than others. Right. So that means that we must, that we must do crimes more than others. Like, no. Um, So again, like there's a lot when it comes to criminal um, justice reform that needs to go into that um, and the mindset and the shift that needs to take place. But I always go back to my brother's story because he is an amazing person and he has never been in trouble in in his life. And uh, to sum up the situation, like he ended up getting arrested and my neighbor that I grew up with, um, because the the area that I lived in Cleveland Heights, I I was one of two black families on my street. Mm -hmm. And, um, my neighbor is like my brother, like he, 
he, he grew up with us, like in our backyard, we played together. And, you know, that situation for my brother to be put in jail and my neighbor not to, yeah. for me at that moment, being a senior in high school, I was like, oh, I finally get it. Mm -hmm. I finally get it. You know, um, I'm very blessed that, you know, my oldest brother went to Yale Law School. So he had a lot of like lawyer friends and we were able to take care of it. But if my brother was poor mm -hmm. and he didn't have those those things in place, what would have happened to him? And those are the hard questions that we have to ask. And those are the hard things that we have to take a look at um, when it comes to those type of situations when with our criminal side of, of, uh, of this country and the way the system is, is, is set up because it's working the way that it was set up. Like, and that's hard to hear, but it's working the way that it was set up. Yeah, it, it's it's time to hear it. It's been said for a long time, but people need to hear it. And we also have to take full responsibility of what kind of media we are putting in. I watch my nieces, especially, I've had many conversations with them, especially over the last two weeks, but I've had them from the beginning. When my niece was two and came and lived with me, uh, she loved Dora the Explorer and I got her this mm -hmm. black Diego doll, you know, and mm -hmm. and. And I remember in the grocery store, somebody asking, why does your baby have a black doll? Like it was mm -hmm. the, and I was like, uh, cause I don't want her to grow up racist. Why doesn't your baby have a black, you know, like it mm -hmm. was, and I've had conversations with them. I'm like, listen, you cannot just consume media where every bad villain is a person of color. Mm -hmm. Like that is just, and that has happened again and again and again. It's subtle little ways that Absolutely. we are being taught Mm -hmm. that we cannot trust each other. Absolutely. And it's from the tiniest little things. And it's those tiny things that, that propel people to then say to us, say to each other, well, George Floyd had a record. And when yeah. I hear that, I was like, okay, one, uh, is my friend at races? What is happening that he can't? But again, he was open. He does mm -hmm. not think of himself as a racist. But when I open that dialogue to say, hey, let's talk about that because that is part of the problem. And he was open to that conversation. I, you know, those are the things we have to kind of talk about. Yeah. And we have to do it intelligently and we have to do it regularly mm -hmm. and we have to do it when it's not comfortable and we have to really watch the media that's happening. We have to watch all of it. And as storytellers, you and I have a very powerful way to tell stories. We get to write the narratives yeah. of what's happening in the wedding industry. And that might seem like such a small part of this whole big discussion, but it matters. It matters so much. And, you know, when it comes to the imagery, I want to say on the flip side of that, um, those images are teaching my children that they're not good enough and that, that they're different. And that especially when it comes to my daughter and our hair, you know, um, I started uh, this black hair experience because I wanted a place to celebrate for women of color to be able to celebrate our hair. Um, for me to go to a wedding and feel that the way that my natural hair grows out of my scalp is going to be seen as something negative, that perception needs to be change. Um, and then with the, within ourselves as the African-American community, because damage has been done um, over generations that think that something is wrong with it, those conversations need to be had. So um, doing that experience has has taught me so much of how much we have to go in the images that we do see and the images that our children see um, to help build that self-confidence to say that there's nothing wrong with you. Um, and as me as a, a wedding photographer, my goal 100% is to show people of color in a positive light. Like that is part of the reason why I decided to go luxury because a lot of times luxury means white. It and does, yeah. I don't think that people see you know, black men having, you know, a family or having a wife, like those images matter so much in a suit and tie. So for me, you know, all my, uh, we talked about like my mission being inclusivity. Um, yeah. And my goal has always been to show couples, interracial couples, black couples, white couples, like to show that love because it's important and those images matter. I'm pushing to be in those magazines. Like it didn't come easy, like getting submitted, submitting a billion times and getting denied and just keep staying steady on what the mission is because opening up that magazine and a little, a little black girl who buys a magazine and to be able to see herself inside of it, that impact is, is, 
unmeasurable in terms of what that may be in her life. So, you know, I do think that we as image makers have so much control over the narrative in terms of the way that we, the perception, because the perception has been negative for a very long time. Like we can't just, I feel like over the last, like, three or four years, like there has been this sort of shift to, you know, um, blackness being mainstream. Like when Black Panther came out, that movie did so much for the black community mm -hmm. because it was like, finally, we can be yeah. the superhero. We can be the villain. We can be the love interest. We can be all of these things. Oh, okay. Like it's not just one way of showing us like that. That movie was so powerful really? and it was just a superhero movie. Just imagine what it could be if it was, you know, if we had other images of like that for children, like my son was a uh, black Panther for so long. Mm -hmm. And it's like, <laughs> that stuff matters for children to be able to see themselves. Um, it matters when we talk about making progress. So we have mm -hmm. a lot of control and we need to understand that it's not just a wedding. It's not, it's not as simple as we think we, we are the ones that are going to shape what we want this wedding industry to be and what we don't want it to be. We have yeah. that power to do that. Yeah. I think, I mean, I remember when I woke up a few years ago to, Oh my gosh, everybody is just a size zero white woman who is 18. And like from there, I made a decision. I will no longer hire models that are below the age of 25. I'm just not going to do that. I want to have all different kinds of body types. I want to have different, you know, different, different, everything, different people, all, all of the diversity. And that's what really creates um, what is Shonda Rhimes? I love Shonda Rhimes. And she has this great, people always asked her at the beginning when she created Grey's Anatomy, like, what does it feel like to have so much diversity? And she was like, I really hate that you asked me that question. I don't like that question. What I am doing is not diversity. What I am doing is normalizing. I am presenting you a normal view of what the world looks like because mm -hmm. the world does not look like skinny white people. The world looks like a black doctor and an Asian doctor and mm -hmm. a chubby lesbian Latina doctor. And, you know, it looks like all these different people. And as storytellers, I don't know how we have been in a trance to just tell one freaking white skinny woman story wedding story again and again and again. It's so old and boring. You know, it's just, it's not its time anymore. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was ever its time, but I think that enough of us hopefully are committed to, to telling the normal stories. It's normalizing. We want to start showing what the normal world can and is, you yep. know? Yeah. yeah. And I identify with that a lot, especially normalizing it. Cause that's how I felt about, you know, entering into the luxury space and shooting, mm -hmm. you know, predominantly black weddings, because this is normal. Like this is, this is what the world is and this is what our world is, you know? So I a hundred percent agree with that. Um, and you know, it's a personal mission. I want to go back to that because unfortunately being diverse has become a business strategy and mm -hmm. I don't like that at all. And I think that we need, it's kind of, I did another podcast and it kind of came up and I, I didn't catch it at the time. And I listened back to it and it was like, I really want to make sure that people understand that we, if you want to see this change, it is in your soul. It is something that you truly want. Do not just do this for your business because yeah. it's only going to last for so long and we're going to be able to see through it. Um, and I just feel like I am, I am, I really want us to be able to change and to be able to um, show different types, like even inside of like, if there's like so many different shapes and sizes and everything inside of like inclusivity is more than just black people. And it's mm -hmm. more than just white people. Like there's so, mm -hmm. like I want to take it a step farther. Like even inside of the black community, there's, there's lesbians, there's gays, there's mm -hmm. all these different types of people. And it's like, I want that to be shown as well. You know, I know that we're spearheading this conversation and, you know, especially with my like Southeast Asian and Asian, you know, counterparts, it's like, where do we fall into this place? And I feel like being allies again, will further the conversation so that the issues that you have as well, like we're just addressing racism as a whole, you know, and the, even inside of diversity and inclusion, like that includes you, <laughs> like yep. that includes that of, of the world being seen the way that the world is, you know? Um, and I, I guess I want to acknowledge that we are up a lot. We're up against a lot. Like yeah. this is not going to be easy. 
like period like this is going to be hard it's going to be uncomfortable it's uncomfortable for me like mm -hmm. i i struggled like when we originally talked like it took me a little bit of time of like do i really want to do this do i really want to talk about this like do i because it's like it is emotionally taxing like it is emotional to be able to to talk about the things that happened to my dad or happened to my brother because I, I wanted the conversation to be centered around black men because they have a very unique um, perception in this world of being extra dangerous. Like yeah. my anger is like being angry is like the perception that usually with black women of losing the message um, is through like our anger. If we're angry, oh, she's just an angry black woman. Like that's yeah. a huge stereotype that, totally. you know, we're up against. But I feel like for me, when I decided to have these type of conversations, it was for them. It was for my dad who went to Knoxville College um, and wasn't allowed to step foot on Knoxville University when he was there. Like those are the type of things that, you know, we like that he went through and like being in the military and being treated dif differently. Like those are the type of things that like his story. So for me, it was like, OK, I'm going to talk about it because at the end of the day, if we don't talk about it and if we act like, you know, that because I'm married and I'm with two kids and I have a college degree that somehow I'm immune to racism. I want you to know that I am not, mm -hmm. I am not at all. I feel like it's, it's, it's just as hard for me as it is for, uh, you know, someone else like, and it's even harder because they, they, they say to me that I'm not, I'm not welcome there or I shouldn't mm -hmm. be there, you know, like somehow that my college degree doesn't matter, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of where, why I decided to do this and, and the importance of how I feel about us taking this action and doing it together. Thank you. Thanks for doing it. I, it is, I mean, the podcast is called Play It Brave and you have been so brave during this discussion and so beautiful and so open and so eye-opening on so many different levels. And um, I am very clunky at interviewing and uh, <laughs> I hope I said things okay, but like, I just really appreciate your spirit. I appreciate your calling. I appreciate all of you getting, you know, the group of 10 that you were talking about, mm -hmm. writing up those those first minimal steps that we can do to inclusivity. I agree with you that, um, you know, over the next few months, we're going to see who was doing things for the, the benefit of their business and who's really dedicated to change. Because mm -hmm. whether you have a business or not, I could give a, a flying whatever about your business. It's who you are at your core. Yeah. It, it's what you care about. It's what kind of world you want your nieces, your nephews, your, your children to live in. It's how you want to show up in this world. Yeah. And at your heart, every person needs to look at that and say, this is what I'm going to stand for. And this is what I'm not going to stand for. And I'm not going to be in a middle ground because guess what, white people, it's really easy for you to just not do anything. It's easy for you to post a Black Lives Matter sign and then never have a discussion again because your life is not in danger. You're not feeling unsafe every day. You're not, you know, mm -hmm. getting racist comments thrown at you. You're not getting denied housing loans. You're not getting denied applications to certain schools. And that's the thing. That's where it really has to step up. And mm -hmm. everybody has to look at who they are on the inside and what they're committed to on a daily basis. Yes, I 100% agree. And, you know, I think that that is the, the direction um, to be able to make some change, um, making these changes at home. And I want to... Um, I want to say again that we cannot wait for the, the leadership to make these changes for yeah. us. We have to do this on a daily basis um, within our own household, within the conversations that we are having. Um, you know, I'm the mother, like majority of us women um, have children or are going to plan on having children. Like we shape so much of uh, the way that our children think and the way that they see the world. So understanding that power that you wield within your household to be able to change things is important. Um, I know that, again, I want to go back to the economic, you know, um, impact because to me, again, that is solidarity. And I, and I know it's so hard to talk about money, especially now during COVID. So many people are suffering. So I want to say again, being solidarity, 
solidarity to our community and being a good ally is seeking out those businesses and seeking out how can you support them and giving them a chance because you'll be surprised at how many times they're not even given a chance. They have the best work or the, mm -hmm. the best systems and everything in place and they're not even given a chance because of biases. So um, I appreciate this time to talk with you. And um, I, again, like I know this is difficult and we just have to give uh, or I'm choosing to give grace and I'm choosing to um, be a vessel to be able to have these tough conversations to be a safe place to have them because I want this I want my son to be safe and that really yeah. is what it boils down for me I don't want to get emotional I want my child to be able to to be in this world and to be able to walk down the street and people don't see him as a threat because I know that when he's 14 or 15 or 16 things are going to change in the way that he's perceived when if he's with his friends outside and he's being loud that you don't feel that you have to call the cops on him and I know that we focus highly on the extreme of of, of, of what happened to George Floyd but on a daily basis these uh, men of color are being criminalized before before they even have a chance to be men. And I think that that is, you know, where the, the catalyst of where, of why I feel that this, this conversation needs to continue and it needs to be an ongoing one and um, it needs to be a personal mission. Yeah, for all the mamas out there. All the mamas. <laughs> we gotta keep the baby safe. We do, we do. And all of them are somebody's baby. They are, they are, and it's really important and like, even in our schools, like, it's just important. Like, I want, I want my children to be able to get a chance. I want their character to speak louder than anything else. The people that I'm rearing them to be like, that's what my father wanted for me. That's what my grandmother wanted for her. Like it goes back. I posted on my Instagram, a photo of my grandmother. Like she knew that education was our way, our, our way out. My, her grandmother was a slave. Let's put that in perspective. My grandmother's grandmother was a slave. My grandmother would be in her kitchen in Birmingham, Alabama, churn ice cream for us because my dad is 70, 74. So just to give you a context of, of like, how, um, I know most parents are younger than that. Um, so my, my grandmother would churn us ice cream and she would tell us stories. She had to walk miles to go to school but she knew that education was her way out. So again, me being an educated black woman, knowing that she instilled that from my dad to me, and I'm putting that into my kids. And for me to sit here and say, you know what? In some regards, that's still not enough. Like, I think about that a lot when people say, mm -hmm. well, you're not married, or like they put all these stereotypes with, with black people. It's like, I fit outside of all of those stereotypes and it's still not enough. And that's what I guess what I want to communicate because that othering, oh, well, Liz, that's not you. It's the other type of black people. No, it is everyone. Like this is something that's universal that we experience in this country. Um, so again, like, I guess with me just ending it, cause I know I don't want to continue to go on. It's just really taking that personal accountability and like making this a, a mission to say to yourself and having those, t uh, those tough conversations and working on you because I can't fix this for you. You yeah. have to fix this, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think I read a quote and I say it all the time and I've been saying it to my family, white people start racism and it's up to white people to end it. Yes. It, it's up to, it's up to us. Mm -hmm. And I honor your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents because you have come from a very powerful, powerful lineage and you're passing it on. I mean, your kids are walking back if you guys <laughs> are watching the YouTube video. And they are just being calm and they are just like, they're just letting their mom talk. And I just yeah. think how powerful that they're in this room with you, hearing you say this and knowing that their mom stands for them for a better life and a better world. And they, mm -hmm. and and I, I don't even know what else to say except for that is who you are. And you have shown us who you are so powerfully today. And you've been very vulnerable in this conversation. And I can't thank you enough. It is, it is a beautiful thing. And I just want you to know I am committed to anything and everything that I'm going to do with my own platform to making sure that your babies are safe. I appreciate that. And thank you so much for the time and giving me your platform. Um, I appreciate the conversation and um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You've been listening to the Play It Brave podcast. Love what you heard? Wonderful. You can shout about it in the reviews. I bet you know someone who needs a shot of self-belief then don't keep us a secret. 
If you've missed something crucial, we've got show notes for this and all past episodes over at darcybenincosa.com forward slash play it brave. Thanks for tuning in. But don't forget, the world teaches you to play it safe. Stand up, stand out and start playing it brave. 